let's say on Saturday night I would party super hard and Sunday morning I was always in church. I'm 27 years old and this upcoming August, God willing, I'll enter the novitiate, which is the next step in religious life. It terrified me, excited me, perplexed me. Are there ever moments of doubt? When I take my eyes off of Christ, then things get confusing. Since around 2000, the number of millennials joining religious life, becoming priests, brothers, sisters, nuns, has been increasing, slightly. Last year, 524 young men and women formally entered a religious community, and half of them were under 25. The numbers are still really small, but they surprise me because they trend against what we so often hear, that millennials have strayed from the religious fold. I think God called me when I was sitting in a church pew, when I was in the eighth grade at St. Augustine grade school in central Kentucky. The priest, you know, like blah, 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 blah. I don't remember most of what he said, but then all of a sudden I remember it clears a bell. The call. It arrives on average at age 19. Some ignore the feelings, but others interpret them literally. God is trying to reach them. And I quickly did what any what 14 year old boy would do and I shoved that down as far, repressed it, suppressed it, whatever, as far as I could. Partying on Saturday night would be alcohol involved, dancing out with people late, you know. There were girlfriends in the picture. Um, later on in college, um, as I was studying for a degree in mechanical engineering, I wanted to work for NASA. It came back up. Richard joined the Franciscans. I first started thinking about religious life when I was in seventh grade, but then when I was in high school, the thought came back. What if God were actually calling me to religious life? And I felt this real attraction to it. Some organizations have started tracking data on the people who receive these calls and answer them. We know that women slightly outnumber men, 70% have college degrees, and 17% were homeschooled. Almost 10% were not born Catholic, but converted later in life. And while American brothers and sisters used to be almost exclusively white, around a third now identify as something else. What we've undertaken is a whole rebranding process for the whole social media outlook of the vocation office of the Order of Friars Minor. I wanted something professional, something catchy. So I hired a millennial design firm. I was looking up hashtags and seeing what's out there, and I landed on Hashtag become a friar had nothing. Who recruits is God, and then I help facilitate the process, though I do commonly refer to myself as the recruiter, because it does communicate effectively that which I do. But as I've dug into this, I've learned that the American Catholic Church is working hard to help God along. One group will pay off college loans. Another runs a website that functions kind of like a dating app pairing people with convents or monasteries that they might have spiritual chemistry with. People often ask me, um, what do you wear under that? And to me, it's like, I would never ask someone that question. On our visit to Cincinnati, Father Richard was interviewing potential applicants to the friary. I think the modern media blows the genital stuff way out of proportion as if everybody's acting like this all day long. And it's not necessarily the case. And so chastity is the proper ordering of it all. I'd say there were some points probably during my second year of college or so where I was feeling it being called. I was kind of pushing it away. I had a girlfriend at the time. It wasn't something I wanted to think about. So. It's good to have a healthy sexuality. We need not confuse that with genital actions, which is often very confused. After college, I was in a serious relationship and I tried pushing away this thought of a religious life. The guy I was with was a really, really great guy, and I didn't want to give him up. People in religious life are in a true relationship. At final vows, you get a wedding ring, and that's just like in a marriage. It's exciting. We're finding a marriage with Christ, and Christ is real. I'm not one to own a lot of things, so giving up what I have would not be very hard. 
My dad was always supportive. He just wanted me to find out how I would be happy. Who agrees with that sense? I do too. It was more difficult for my mom and my sister. Yeah. Um, did my mom immediately come on board and say, this is the greatest thing ever, we're gonna have a priest now. That's another thing that sets this generation apart. Their parents aren't into it, like they might once have been. Yeah, in the 1950s, is ooh, my boy the priest, you know, privilege, step up, status, step up. And then so later on, as that pedophilia stuff was everywhere, it causes your support group to think, are you joining this because you have the problems? You aren't that way, are you? You, you're, you know, you're not a, you're not trying to hide from something, are you? No. Jesus, take me to the higher ground. It's pretty clean around here. Yeah, that was one thing entering the convent. You don't clean because things are dirty. You clean to keep them clean. A sister's day is regimented. Mass, breakfast, class, then back to the chapel for an examination of conscience. Lunch, scriptures. There are scheduled times for cleaning and working out. We are allowed to have Facebook as postulants, but it's kept to a, more of a minimum. In the evenings, the sisters watch international news so they know who in the world to pray for. After World War II, there was this huge rush of men and women into religious communities. But in the 1960s, the Vatican launched a reform program and a lot of people left. Some because the church had gone too far, some because it hadn't gone far enough. When people walked, there was no one to take their place. Last year, 70% of religious institutes reported no new entrants. We had to confront hard issues, and they want to know where we stand. The hot-button issues of the church, same-sex attraction, the pro-life movement. I know that for the last decade or so, there's been a big conversation within the church about whether homosexuals could be admitted. What has your community decided to do on that question? Our community is founded on chastity. How are you living that chaste celibate life? If someone is gay, but commits to a chaste and celibate life, could he become a brother here? It would color how they are to join. Um, and this is much bigger than me as vocation director. I'm a screener. I'm not a decision maker. The church has also been pressed on its treatment of women and its reaction to modern feminism. Define feminism. <laughs> Well, I mean, already that's kind of, it's, it's not a confident yes, right? It's... I don't believe in self-assertion of feminism. I believe in the selflessness of women. It, that's the kind of woman that I hope to be as a religious. Even amongst young men and women who heed the call, not everyone will stick around. Half of these young people will leave before they even start. But here's something else to consider. Yes, American millennials are far less religious than their parents or grandparents but they're still really religious compared to other industrialized countries. Half of younger millennials say they're absolutely certain that God exists. It's every boy's dream to be a superhero, and I think this is, this is the best way to do that. Amen. For another film about how religious communities are trying to negotiate with modern technology and the internet, watch our film about Amish life. And of course, if you don't already, subscribe to NBC Left Field.